So we are moving to the warfarin basically. So warfarin is vitamin K dependent, all these things. I'm not going into that. You already know that. So we are straight away going to the exam based oriented questions. So this is very popular in exam and one question at least one in one paper, maybe two questions from this table will be, will be appearing in your upcoming exam. So this is a British Society of Hematology guidelines. Uh, remember one thing uh, that Pro, you know, um, prothrombin concentrate uh, that is preferred over AFFP in case of major bleeding. That is first. If that is not available, only then they go for the FFP. This one is first thing that you need to remember. The second is the situational analysis. So what happens uh, if a patient is on uh, warfarin and the toxicity appears, that means severe bleeding episode, all that by line, and how we need to, uh, you know, uh, counter that. So this is the table. Again, very important table. Uh, so first of all, first concern is the major bleeding. So there we need not think of any INR, just major bleeding, torrential bleeding, hematomasis or whatever ICH is happening or severe, uh, you know, um, bleeding, GI bleeding is uh, evident. So first you need to stop the warfarin and then IV vitamin K. You have to give 5 mg IV vitamin K and then prothrombin concentrate. That's the treatment. So this is one place where you need to give IV and at the highest dose that is 5 mg. Now the second scenario is a slightly moderate scenario. It's still very severe because INR is more than 8. There is a severely high INR and minor bleed is there, screen bleeding, maybe GI bleed, but that is less now or it is stopped. It's not torrential. So then you have to stop the warfarin. Again, you give IV vitamin K. If remember one thing, you have to give IV vitamin K whenever there is active bleeding, IV. If it is a severe bleeding, then dose of IV will be high. If it is less than severe bleeding, then IV dose will be less. Severe bleeding, IV dose is cut throat 5 mg. Mild to moderate bleeding, IV dose is less. It is up to the clinician. 1 to 3 mg is up to the uh, discretion of the clinician. And then you have to repeat uh, INR after 24 hours. You have to repeat vitamin K considering the next scenario after 24 hours, depending on the IR. And you always have to start restart warfarin whenever INR is less than 5. In India, in many places, people still prefer 4, but in aspirin nice, it is less than 5, you restart it. INR more than 8, no bleeding, third scenario. You stop warfarin. So INR going above 8, stop warfarin. Now here you have to give vitamin K to reverse, but it is oral vitamin K. Don't go for IV. And that is again 1 to 5 mg. Repeat vitamin K, oral dose or IV dose depending on INR or bleeding complication. But the important point is you have to recheck INR after 24 hours. And you have to restart vitamin, uh, sorry, this is not vitamin K, this is restart warfarin need to restart warfarin after or whenever the INR value is less than 5. So we are coming to you. Minor bleed is present and INR is not that high, but it's still above 5 and below 8. Warfarin to be stopped. You give IV vitamin K. Again, remember, whenever bleeding is there, give IV. But since it is minor bleed, you give it 1 to 3 mg. And restart warfarin again when the INR is less than 5. INR 5 to 8 and no bleeding is there. So what to do? Here you did not need not do any vitamin K. You just stop warfarin for one day or two days and then you repeat it. You reduce subsequent dose. You check the patient's diet and move on. That's the thing. Okay. So this is again a very important table. I would like you to take a snapshot, the very important table. Can expect at least one question. We are moving on to the next one in few seconds. If you are taking a snapshot, complete it and we'll move on. I think you must be done. Now we are moving on to the next. So other very common 
uh, drug aspirin, we need to understand what aspirin does. It blocks COX-1 and COX-2, cycloxygen S pathway. So basically cycloxygen S, they blanketly, they block cycloxygen S1 and 2. And cycloxygen S are connected with formation of, um, you know, prostaglandin, prostacycline and thromboxane A2. So since they block it, the intraplatelet thromboxane A2 is blocked, which will lead to inhibition of platelet aggregation. So that is the way they, you know, um, uh, they showcase their antiplatelet activity. Remember one thing, uh, till date, as per NICE, aspirin is not licensed for primary prevention. This is very important, need to remember before, you know, um, going to exam. Certain things which are slightly different from our day-to-day -day Indian practice, remember one thing, Older guidelines by NICE, they used to prefer aspirin in ischemic heart disease, and they used to prefer aspirin plus dipyridamol in severe and TIA. Remember, newer guidelines prefer clopidogrel. Remember this one. So in CVA, in TIA, they prefer clopidogrel. In IHD, sing, as single antiplatelet, they prefer clopidogrel. This is the newer guidelines. Now we're coming to the clopidogrel. So these are the thionopyridine group of antiplatelets. The other people in this group are ticagrel or prasugrel, ticlopidin. Mode of action, how they stop it? So basically, they are antagonist of P2Y adenosine diphosphate receptor on platelet. So basically, they inhibit the activation of platelet. So they are antiplatelet by this way. So they blocks P2Y ADP receptor. Again, this is a question. This question I faced during my exam, I can remember. So remember another two, three things, basically, as I already have mentioned, and also I think the people who are uh, dealing with riches who are dealing with cardio and neuro, they have already extensively discussed with this clopidoglin and other thing. Remember one or two pharmacological aspect only, concurrent PPI use as per NICE guideline, NICE warning, and MHRA warning, concurrent PPI use may make clopidogrel less effective in IHD and, you know, I mean, in its antiplatelet activity. But even in such cases, two PPIs are notorious. Two PPIs are to be used very cautiously. One is omiprazil, the second is esomiprazil. They have maximum influence on clopidogrel. And the safest one as per MHR guideline is lansoprazole. So this information you need to remember. After this, we are moving to the next topic. Uh, just here I am just, uh, since dipyridamol is there, not much use nowadays. So they, this is phosphodiesterase inhibitor basically, and it decreases the intracellular calcium. And uh, ultimately it decreases the cellular uptake of adenosine and ultimately what happens the thromboxane synthesis is blocked basically antiplatelet and in previous guidelines is used to be used with aspirin aspirin plus dipyridamol mostly in prevention secondary prevention of cva or tia that's it so this is not much important nowadays not many questions come on the basis of this but this one is important hyperlipidemia drugs we are moving to this the basic side effect profile and the I mean, uh, mode of action, we need to brush up. So first is statin. We all know HMG CoA reductase inhibitor. So what is the you know, adverse effect of statin? That is myositis and uh, deranged LFT. First one, azetimib, that is that decreases the gut absorption of cholesterol and major side effect is headache. Nicotinic acid. It decreases the hepatic VLDL handling and flushing and myositis are more common adverse effect. Fibrates, the PPA are alpha agonist that increases the expression of lipoprotein lipase and in this way they are more effective on triglycerides. Their adverse effect profile is myositis, cholestatic jaundice and pruritus and lastly cholesterolamine who are basically bilescent uh, sequestrants. They decrease bile acid reabsorption in uh, small intestine and their major side effects is GI disturbance. 
remember one more point one more tip is all this myositis or left derangement chances increase when we combine two hyperlipidemia drugs so that is also another point to be addressed in the exam so all this statin plus phenofibrate they are more dangerous for precipitating the adverse reaction